similar to Freemasonry, called the German Order. Liszt died in 1919, but he left behind an admirer who would continue his ideas with the greatest zeal, master of the German Order, Adolf Lanz. In 1899, Lanz had founded a cult known as the New Templars and declared himself to be the Grand Master. Thus it was that he combined the characteristics of the Knights Templars with zealous racism. In 1905, he began publishing the anti-Semitic magazine Ostara to spread his racist ideas. In one article, Lantz claimed that members of the master race sat differently from other people and even had a different foot structure. According to Lanz's superstitious belief, there was a so-called fight for survival between yellow and black, a struggle which yellow had to win at all costs. Right from the first edition of the magazine, Sebattendorf, the future founder of the Thule Society, was there among his followers and the proponents of the ideology he had infected them with. Sebattendorf, a member of the German order, was a Freemason. Thus it was that mysticism, racism, admiration for old pagan cultures, and a hierarchical organization similar to that of Freemasonry all came together. In effect, this was the birth of Nazism. Pike wrote of the Third World War. Third World War must be fomented by taking advantage of the differences caused by the agents of the Illuminati between the political Zionists and the leaders of the Islamic world. The war must be conducted in such a way that Islam, the Muslim Arabic world, and political Zionism, the state of Israel, mutually destroy each other. Meanwhile, the other nations, once more divided on the issue, will be constrained to fight to the point of complete physical, moral, spiritual, and economic exhaustion. We shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists, and we shall provoke a formidable social cataclysm in which, in all its horror, will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute atheism, origin of savagery, and of the most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere the citizens, obliged to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries, will exterminate those destroyers of civilization and the multitude disillusioned with Christianity, whose deistic spirits will from that moment be without compass or direction, anxious for an ideal, but without knowing where to render its adoration, will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer, brought finally out in the public view. This manifestation will result from the general reactionary movement which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time." End quote. It's pretty heavy, eh? In this country we have a God-given inalienable right to believe whatever religion we wish to believe or not believe in a religion. But no one has the authority to force us to believe in the Luciferian doctrine or any other doctrine. However, slowly we are, as a society, accepting the Luciferian doctrine as it's being sold to us through <laughs> the products that we buy, to the movies that we watch, to the lies that we are subjected to by the mass media and our so-called politicians. Is it all starting to make sense? Because we got a long way to go. And please stay tuned, this is important information. This information is so suppressed, so few people believe it. Even if they know of it, they don't believe it. And they need to know the truth. Since the false flag terror attacks of September 11th, 2001, and more recently with the rise of Islamic terrorism, world events, particularly in the Middle East and Africa, there is a current genocide against Christians, Muslims, and Jews 
and growing unrest and instability between Zionism and Islam, is there not? But let us not forget that ISIS, ISIS, is the anagram for Israeli Secret Intelligence Service, as well as one of the gods worshipped in the mystery of religion. And now Russia is getting heavily involved. The pot is boiling. What's happening today with Islamic terrorism clearly indicates that the Third World War is not far off. And let's not forget Junior Il, the psychotic child dictator in North Korea, shooting off his weapons. <laughs> it's like a little it's like a little little child, but a dangerous psycho. Then these are very dangerous times. A pivotal time in our history, as it was in eighteen seventy one when Pike penned his letter to Mazzini. We cannot emotionally dismiss the intellectual fact that both world wars occurred as were described in the letter, or the current crisis that exists between Islam and the West. This should be as disconcerting as it is illuminating. Socialism originated from observing the success of capitalism. This observation was made long before any labor strife by the adepts of the secret society known as the Order of the Quest. You see, for most of human history, man has been enslaved or under the rule of kings. David Rockefeller said, quote, All we need is the right crisis and the nations of the world will accept the new world order. The plan to use socialism as a means to achieve this goal, this is a key fact to understanding what socialism really is. A method of supreme control over the individual for the perceived benefit of the collective. You see, socialism is a socioeconomic system where the ownership of industry and the distribution of wealth are determined not by the market, not by our efforts, but by the state or the collective. But in truth, the distribution of wealth is determined by the elite oligarchs behind the scenes. So much of this wealth is intentionally siphoned off by costly and sometimes intentionally wasteful projects and welfare programs that benefit corporate interests owned by these same oligarchs. So while they give the people what they want, they take from them all they have. This little realized fact is as ingenious as it is insidious. In its most general sense, socialism seeks the co-prosperity and common cause of all people a noble goal. This could be accomplished without force in religious and utopian communities, but in practice it is nothing less than theft by the totalitarian use of force to redistribute wealth. Socialism originated from observing the success of capitalism. It began as a reaction to labor exploitation and unemployment in Europe in the 19th century. But the elements of socialism have a much longer history as described in Plato's Republic and Thomas More's Utopia. Plato's Republic even advocates the sharing of wives and children. The Oneida community in Oneida, New York, had similar fetishes in the mid-1800s. Aristotle criticized the idealism of Plato's Republic. He argued that if all were held in common, nothing would get cared for, and that if people had no property, they could not host a guest or perform charitable acts that create community and give life meaning. In Aristotle's Politics, he noted that socialism has also been used as a slogan and a tool of manipulation and control to gain favor by unscrupulous leaders seeking political power who prey upon the many socioeconomic frustrations of low-paid or unemployed people during hard economic times. My, doesn't that sound familiar? Who does that bring to mind? Hitler's National Socialism in Germany, Mussolini and Franco's Fascism, Lenin and Stalin's Soviet Socialism, all started out with prosperous beginnings of hope and change. All became totalitarian states that denied personal freedom to citizens with no checks and balances on power. What is most worrisome is that in America today, under the current Obama regime, these same conditions exist. Obama's tyranny is done with smiles and accusations of unfairness as his Marxist policies unfairly burden the middle class. It is also glaringly obvious 
that there is politically motivated selective enforcement in the rule of law regarding who does and who does not get prosecuted. It is a lawless, soft tyranny, but tyranny nonetheless. This is why former Attorney General Eric Holder and IRS vampire Lois Lerner aren't in prison. This is why we have lax border and immigration control. There are many examples of the Obama administration's usurpations of the Constitution and putting Americans' lives and national security in peril for political purposes. We see this with the Benghazi video fabrication, Hillary Clinton's email scandal, Operation Fast and Furious, and other crimes that are not being prosecuted or properly investigated. The list is long. Where's the justice? No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. Hands up, don't shoot, which wasn't even, didn't even happen. Straight out of the Marxist playbook of Rules for Radicals by Saul Alinsky. Slogans, symbols, hidden meanings, secret agendas. As the Democrats rightly railed on G.W. Bush for his unconstitutional tyrannies and lies about weapons of mass destruction, these same party liners ignore their own dear leader's many lies and many acts of sedition, treason, and tyranny because it suits their political ideology. That is not fairness, that is not equality, and it is certainly not justice. But Obama and his supporters should not be given all the blame for the rise of socialism in America. After all, he was merely selected and groomed to be president because of his Marxist views. Like Nazism, Socialism, Fascism, Zionism, and Communism are all the work of the secret society known as the Order of the Quest. Communism was not devised by Karl Marx and Frederick Engel, but they were tasked to write the Communist Manifesto. The Communist Manifesto is an Illuminati doctrine commissioned by Nathan Meyer Rothschild and ghostwritten by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels in 1848, just before the revolutions of 1848 swept across Europe. One critical piece of history that is generally omitted or suppressed is the fact that the Rothschild banking cartel funded the revolutions of 1848. The Rothschilds also financed the Hessian army for the British during the American Revolution. They have funded both sides of every major conflict since, including, of course, the revolutions of 1848. Karl Marx was born on May 5, 1818. He was an Ashkenazi Jew that descended from a long line of Talmudic rabbis in Trier in the Kingdom of Prussia. He was one of the Illumined, an adept of the Order of the Quest. During the Napoleonic War of the Sixth Coalition, Marx's father, Herschel Mordecai, became a Freemason in 1813, joining the Lage, Le Toil, and Satique, the Hanseatic Star in Osnabrück. After the war, Herschel Mordecai faked a conversion to Lutheranism to better infiltrate Prussian society and pretended to be an assimilated bourgeoisie, enlightened liberal, interested in free thought. One of Karl Marx's grandparents was Nanette Solomon Barrett Cohn, who belonged to a wealthy Amsterdam family. Her cousin had married Nathan Meyer Rothschild and bore Lionel Nathan Rothschild baron and member of parliament for the city of London. Yes, for those who are not in the know, Karl Marx and Nathan Meyer Rothschild were cousins. Marx married an aristocrat, Jenny von Westphalen, in 1843 and moved to London. He used to visit the Red Lion Pub at Great Windmill Street, Soho, where he and Frederick Engels were asked to write the doctrine that would become the Communist Manifesto by an Order of the Quest Illuminati Front Organization called the League of the Just. Interestingly enough, there's a pub in Massachusetts where presidents of state and celebrities called the Red Lion Inn in Stockbridge, Massachusetts in the Berkshires. And the concept of the Red Lion, the concept of the Red Shield, which is the Rothschild shield, Rothschild is red shield, um, you start to see that there are a lot of interesting uh, similarities and things that bore out of these similarities and became what we know as communism, what we know as collectivism, and what we know as the New World Order. 
Jordan Maxwell 